Um, my name is Matt Crichton and I'm from the ACNC's um, Guidance and Education team and joining me to um, bring you all her knowledge and expertise on charity tax concessions is Mel Gibbs from the ATO's not-for-profit advice section. Hello Mel. Hi Matt, how are you going? Very good. Um, Mel's in Sydney um, and I'm in Melbourne so uh, the audio might sound different between the two of us but I'm sure it won't be a problem and you'll be able to hear us both equally clearly. Just before we get into the details of today's webinar, just a couple of um, admin things to cover. First, if you're having any trouble with the audio for the webinar, you have an option to uh, dial in to the webinar and use the audio through your phone. You should have received um, a phone number and an access code in the confirmation email that uh, you received when you signed up for the webinar. So if you call that number and into that access code, and PIN I think it asks for, asks for as well, um, you should be able to join in the webinar over your phone. But of course, you don't need to worry about that if you're not having any troubles with audio. We do have a couple of colleagues helping out with some questions as we go along. That's Chris and Heath. Uh, so if you have any questions as we're moving through the formal presentation, don't hesitate to put them in the uh, question section there on the GoToWebinar control panel. Shoot through a question and either Chris or Heath will be able to get back to you. But it's a good idea just to keep them general if you can. If you've got something really specific about your charity's tax concessions and something that uh, some details that you want clarified, it's probably best to give us a call and, and have a chat to one of our advice service staff about that. And if that um, doesn't provide you with the answer, maybe the ATO's advice staff as well. And we do have quite a crowd today, so we, we'll try our best to get to all the questions as we go along. But if we do miss a few, um, we will endeavour to get back to you via email later. We do have a record of all the questions that come through, so we have no problems um, chasing that up and, and sending you an email later on. And just on that, we do record the webinars and publish them on our website later. So if you do get called away for something or you have to leave early, it's um, no problems. You'll be able to watch a recording of this webinar on our website in the, um, the coming days. And we'll send out a follow-up email with some links to extra resources and to the recorded webinar um, in a couple of days, so you can look out for that. Okay, with all the admin stuff out the way, let's get into the content for today's webinar. What we'll cover is, first we'll look at some charity tax concessions, we'll look at how the ACNC and the ATO work together, how it works in practice. We'll cover deductible gift recipients, which is um, evidently a really popular topic. A lot of people here are interested in this one and eligibility for for being endorsed as a deductible gift recipient. Then we'll look at a couple of specific charity types, um, them, uh, those written on your screen at the moment, health promotion charities and public benevolent institutions. And finally, we'll have some time to take questions too. So if you'd prefer to watch the formal presentation in full before you ask a question, that's great. And we will be able to um, take any questions, of course, via text, but we'll answer them live at the end of the formal presentation. Okay, now just to get started, the, the ATO, uh, sorry, the ACNC's role in charity tax concessions. I'll give you a brief overview. The ACNC is the national regulator of charities and the, the role of the ACNC is to register organisations as charities, amongst a few other things. Charities must be registered with the ACNC to access Commonwealth Charity Tax Concessions from the ATO. So although it's a separate uh, realm of, of authority, there is that link um, by virtue of needing to be registered as a charity to access Commonwealth Charity Tax Concessions. So the ACNC doesn't decide on Commonwealth Charity Tax Concessions. That's the ATO's job. What the ACNC does is decide whether or not your organisation is eligible to be registered as a charity and, and what type of charity it's eligible to be registered as. And that may have an effect on the tax concessions available to you as well. So in theory, this, the process would be that an organisation comes to the ACNC, the ACNC assesses its eligibility for a charity or a particular charity type, it has a look and approves that and then passes the information over to the ATO who is responsible for um, endorsing charity tax concessions. And the third dot point there, that some charity tax concessions are only available for particular types of charities. So it's not it, it's not a, a blanket one 
a charity tax concession that is applied to all charities, it, it does get into some details about um, some details which are concerned with the type of charity that the organisation is and the type of tax concessions that are available for those charities. All right, I think that's enough from my voice for the time being at least. I'll pass over to Mel now, who will be able to take us over the ATO's role within this broader charity realm. Mel, can you just give us um, a brief rundown on how it works on the ATO side? Great, thanks Matt. Um, so Matt's already talked about the ACNC's role and um, the ATO's role is administering um, the tax system. So it's a little bit separate to charity and, and, and a little bit broader. Um, what we do is administer tax concessions that include DGR endorsements um, and we endorse them and administer them. Um, after the ACNC has decided on your charity status um, and you know when you've been registered, the ATO will then decide on your organisation's eligibility for tax concessions. Um, for some of these concessions, the ATO may also have some special conditions that you'll need to meet before you can receive them. And, you know, an example of that is that, you, that you're established and operated in Australia or um, for income tax exemption, we'll go into this a bit more in detail, that you um, have to predominantly, you know, spend your money within Australia. Um, the tax concessions... Oh, so, did you want to talk about it? Oh, no, no, sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you continue. And just the last point there is that any tax concessions that we do endorse you for um, will be visible on the ABN lookup at abr.business.gov.au. That last point is probably worth um, just focusing on for a minute because I think a lot of people will go to the ATO's website or the ACNC's charity register to have a look at the charity tax concessions for a particular organisation. But that's at the moment, at least, that's not the spot where you'll find it. It is, it is the ABN lookup at abr.business.gov.au. Do you, you receive some requests, Mel, at the ATO to, to um, well, people have gone to the ATO to find tax um, concessions for an organisation? Is that a common request? Y yes, we okay. do. Um, and, and occasionally, like, you might find that that ABN lookup you know, sometimes it can take a day or two to update from when we've given you an endorsement role. So um, if you do have a problem with the way that your charity's um, concessions are displayed on the ABR, um, the first point of call is to come to the ATO with that. Okay. So that's another another thing probably worth um, just, just jotting down that you still need to speak to the ATO about the tax concessions listed for your charity if it is incorrect on the Australian Business Registers ABN lookup. Um, and it is updated regularly. So, so if someone looks on the ABR, uh, abr.business.gov.au and sees that it's out of date or incorrect and they see that again a few days later and another few days later, that's not because of the updating period. That, that might be, be that there's an error, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, now how the ACNC and the ATO work together. So we mentioned that the ACNC's role is to register charities and regulate the charity sector more broadly, and the ACO, ATO's job is to endorse, assess and endorse charity tax concessions. Um, the ACNC, as I mentioned before, We'll look at a charity, an organisation's eligibility to be registered as a charity, and once it's done with that application, we'll pass on the information to the ATO, who will then um, make the assessment based on the information that the ACNC has. So there's no need for an organisation to separately go to the ATO and provide another application. It's all done within the registration form to register as a charity with the ACNC. However, the um, that depends on the stage of the uh, organisation itself. So, for example, if an organisation is already registered as a charity and therefore doesn't need to come through the ACNC to get charity endorsement but would like to apply for a certain tax concession, maybe they didn't have it before or a different tax concession, they would apply directly to the ATO. Isn't that right, Mel? Yes, that is right. Um 
um, the majority of our applications do come through by the ACNC. So it's, it, it um, is a seamless process for new charities that are registering with the ACNC. But if a charity needs to update or change its concessions, they can come directly to us. And that also, but that would also depend on the requirements of the particular tax concession, right? For example, if an already existing charity that's already registered as a charity goes to the ATO to make some change to their tax concessions, if that change requires also a change to their charity status, then that would also need to come through the ATO, uh, sorry, the ACNC. Yes, that's right. It's quite confusing, isn't it? Yeah, it <laughs> I can think be. the key here is that if you're unsure, um, always give us a ring um, and we can kind of set you down the path that you need to go on straight away. And as Mel said, in most cases, a new organisation will, will come to the ACNC to register as a charity and then the information that they provide to the ACNC to be registered as a charity will be passed on to the ATO in a seamless process to be to have the uh, tax concessions endorsed. Um, Mel, just quickly, with, when the tax concessions are endorsed, because on the ACNC side, once we finish with a charity application, we notify the applicant, the organisation, that they have been registered as a charity and that they're on the charity register and um, give them some information about being registered as a charity. Does the ATO also send its own notification to let them know that tax concessions have been applied? Yes, we do. So the, the way that it happens, pretty much as soon as the ACNC has registered a new charity, the very next day we get a report that tells us um, who the new charities are and we go and download um, all the applications and their governing documents and then and we start to process the tax concession. So that's happening pretty much from the next working day afterwards. Um, in, you know, I'd say about 80% of the cases, cases we don't really need to talk to the client or get any additional information so we approve them and we'll just give them a call and let them know it's been approved and their notice will go out in the mail um, on those that you know the rest of the applications that we have we might need a, a small bit of information so we'll contact the applicant and have a talk to them and let them know that we've got their their application okay now let's get into some of the details of charity tax concessions with use that broad heading a bunch of times already in the webinar, what are we actually talking about when we say charity tax concessions? Uh, it's, it's kind of like a suite, really, of, okay. of tax concessions. So um, the, the big one and the one that kind of applies to everyone is income tax exemption. And I think before I, I move on and talk about these in any more detail, I need to stress that um, charity charities, so even if you're not um, registered with the ACNC, but if if you have a charitable purpose, um, then you must be endorsed by the ATO to access these concessions. So income tax exemption, that generally means that you don't lodge income tax returns and all of the income of your organisation will be exempt from income tax. So it's a pretty good concession. Um, the next one that's on there is a goods and services tax concession. Now, this is definitely not an exemption from GST. What it, what it does is it provides certain types of organisations with um, a concession in how they'll work out how GST applies to the things that they do. So a good example might be a school tuck shop. Um, they'd have the opportunity to treat their supplies as input tax, so they wouldn't be um, claiming any GST back on things that they've purchased for the tuck shop, but they're not going to be putting GST onto the sales of the food in that tuck shop. Um, we also have certain rules for working out how to how GST will apply to the sale of secondhand goods or if you're providing things at uh, or accommodation at less than the market value. So different concessions. Our website has a lot of detailed information on all the different types of concessions and how they apply to different types of organisations. It's and not an exemption. And that's the key right there. It, it will be different, practically speaking, it will be different for different organisations depending on the nature of their activities and, and how they need to apply GST. 
That's right. And and for some organisations, there's, there's this question about whether or not they need to register for GST. Um, and, you know, you might not even need to consider that. So another one of the concessions is that you don't need to register for GST until your turnover hits $150,000. So a lot of organisations will choose not to register so they don't even have to worry about it. Um, so that's a concession in itself. Yeah, right. Um, the next one on there is fringe benefits tax rebate or exemption FBT and this is um, a, a concession that's available to um, not for profit organisations or charities that have employees and they provide them with um, things other than um, cash salary and wages so they're providing them with benefits instead of salary and um, it, it enables uh, organisations to provide them at a reduced rate of fringe benefits tax some organisations, and we'll talk about them, I know it's coming up, <laughs> um, have a, an exemption, which is a very attractive concession that's available. So, and that might be where um, some of the more, confusion lies with GST. Some people have seen the word exemption within the suite of charity tax concessions, but that's, that's because it applies to some organisations for fringe benefits tax, not for GST. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, and the last concession that's on there is a refund of franking credits, which I think it's been a hot topic in the news lately. Um, so um, registered charities that are endorsed by the ATO um, as tax concession charities are able to claim a refund of um, imputation credits um, and they do that via an application to the ATO. Now this is available to these endorsed charities only. Um, Normally, people would claim this through the income tax system, but because these charities are income tax exempt and they don't lodge tax returns, they're able to lodge a special claim um, to claim back those franking credits. Okay, so this suite is pretty much what all registered charities will get once they've jumped through the ACNC's hoops and they've got their charity status. They can expect to get this suite of um, charity tax concessions from the ATO. Yes, they can. Um, of course, they have to apply for them. They have to tell us what they want. But generally, our people um, in our team, we will talk to you about what you're entitled to, like what concessions you are eligible, do you want them, what they're for, and, and get you endorsed in the right way. Yep. And we don't want to mislead people and think that it's um, uh, an in entirely uh, rubber stamp process where there is no oversight whatsoever from the ATO in this application process. There still is um, a step that um, needs to be taken with the ATO, which involves um, you know, people uh, looking at the application and endorsing it, but it's just that the registration for uh, being a charity, the work has already been done on the side of the ACNC. Yeah, and that's the hard job. We say. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, now into the next bit, which I think will be of interest for a lot of the audience because um, uh, just having a look at some of the comments that came through um, when people registered that there was uh, lots of interest in deductible gift recipients. Mills, do you just want to give us, do you just want to give us an overview of, well, first, what is a deductible gift recipient? So a deductible gift recipient, it's completely, it's a separate endorsement to our tax concession endorsement. Um, and it's an endorsement for an organisation to enable them to receive tax deductible gifts from their donors. Um, so anyone can give to uh, a charity or a not-for-profit, but um, donors can only claim a tax deduction on their tax return if the organisation they've given to is endorsed by us as a deductible gift recipient. Okay. Um, that's and that's it in a nutshell. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, so it makes it, it's an endorsement that um, is um, it, well. It, it makes giving. Um, you know, you can entice donors. Um, there's a, a little sweetener there when they're giving to you that they'll be able to claim a deduction on their tax return. And I guess that's um, where so it's not, attractive for charities because. Um, Maybe maybe the two dollar or five dollar donations is one thing, but but particularly for people looking to give large amounts of money, I guess having that deductible gift recipient endorsement means that you know being able to claim back that large donation would would be an attractive proposition. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, so I think now it's a you know it's an important point to make that not all charities are eligible for endorsement um, as a deductible gift recipient. So we have um, different categories of DGRs, and they all have their own eligibility requirements. Um, at the moment, there are about fifty categories. Yeah, right. Um, okay. Some of, <laughs> just a few then. some of them, yeah, just a few. Some are really broad, um, or you know, they, the you know, the majority of our endorsements or within those you know handful of categories oh, yeah. um, and then some of them are really prescriptive like you know you have to be a TAFE or a university and um, you, you know your school building fund will never be a university so yeah. for each of the categories there's different um, there's different eligibility requirements um, and we've got a figure on there at about about 38 percent of registered charities are endorsed as DGRs so that's a pretty um, that's a pretty static figure. That's kind of the, the percentage of the population that we see that are endorsed as DGRs. Um, and the really the key thing here is that DGR endorsement is decided by the ATO. Um, those requirements, they sit in the tax law and um, it's, it's the ATO's responsibility to administer those, you know, those, that DGR endorsement. Yeah. There are some DGR categories, and we'll talk about them in a minute, that... Um, have some pretty specific prerequisites that the ACNC makes decisions on. Um, but just because you are that doesn't then necessarily mean that you're eligible for the DGR endorsement with the ATO. Yeah, and I think it was a, it's a really good point to linger on for a moment, um, the one about not all charities being eligible for endorsement as a DGR. And that figure of 38%, I think for from a general public's point of view, would be surprisingly low because there, uh, there may be that misconception that all charities are deductible gift recipients and any donation to any charity you can then claim back on your own personal income tax. But as you can see with the information on the slide here, that, that's not the case and less than half of registered charities actually have the uh, endorsement that allows a donor to claim back the donations that they make to the organisation, which just goes to show that yeah. the DGR uh, endorsement, um, it, it really is a, a separate thing and not something that you should just assume all charities have simply because they are registered as a charity. Yeah, there's a, you know, and a good a good example of that is, or you've got a um, a charitable category about um, caring for animals, haven't you? What's your uh, yeah advanced ad charitable uh, yeah, yeah animal welfare? Yep. Yep. So we have an animal welfare charity um, category as well, but just because you are registered with the ACNC under that charitable subtype, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you will qualify for our animal welfare DGR category, which is a little bit more specific than um, the, the broad charitable purpose one. So when you come to us, we'll be looking at the types of activities that you do and they need to meet, you know, particular requirements. That's probably a good one to just um, illustrate that point because, yeah, while the ACNC may register an organisation under the, tub, the, the, the full um, category type for the ACNC for the charity is preventing or relieving the suffering of animals. So even though you may do that, don't automatically assume that your organisation will then just have the DGR endorsement rubber stamped. It just goes to show that the ATOs uh, step in looking at the deductible gift recipient application and, and then endorsing it is um, has a little bit more involved as well. Oh, we were going to talk to um, Matt just while we're on this slide that we do have these 50 odd categories that the ATO looks after. Um, and then every now and then a very special type of organisation might come along that um, is doing something very unique that provides um, very like benefit to the the broad Australian community um, and organizations like that that don't fit into um, a category can go through a parliamentary process to be specifically listed in the tax law so that it, that involves um, applying um, for specific listing through Department of Treasury um, it's a quite a long and arduous process 
process that um, is never guaranteed because it's a parliamentary process, but it, it is there for organisations that do have a particular uniqueness and can demonstrate their um, their their benefit to the, the the Australian community. Okay, right. So that's that's one option. I presume that's not. Not not the most common uh, avenue that charities take if they're seeking DGR endorsement. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> A difficult one. Okay, um, there are some particular types of charities that um, may be endorsed as um, may get DGR endorsement by virtue of them being on particular government registers, and we've got a few of them listed here. Um, Mel, do you just want to give us an overview of, of what this means? Because the we've spoken about the ACNC's role in this, where the ACNC will register an organisation as a charity, and the ATO's role, where the ATO will then get that information and endorse the organisation for the tax concessions that's available that that are available to it. What about these four DGR registers? So these four um, registers, they are four separate categories of DGR um, and the prerequisite for, for being endorsed there is that they are approved by another government department and they're put on a register. So at the moment we have Register of Environmental Organisations, the Register of Cultural Organisations, Register of Harm Prevention Charities and our Overseas Aid Gift Deduction Scheme, um, sometimes just referred to as Overseas Aid Funds. Um, so at the moment, <laughs> with these um, DGR categories, um, organisations need to, uh, you know, obviously come through, get their uh, cells registered with the ACNC, but um, in a separate process, kind of after that, their application is assessed by a separate government department um, and goes through, a, you know, a number of processes and sign-offs. Some of these actually require, like, two ministers to sign off on them before they'll come back to the ATO and, and be DGR endorsed. So um, it's quite a lengthy process at the moment. Um, now we, we've got some information there that there were some um, big DGR reforms that were announced at the end of last year, which will mean that these registers are going to now be incorporated with the ACNC Charity Register. So they won't be maintained, the register won't be maintained separately with each of those government departments. They'll come over and their information will be on the ACNC's charity register. And as part of that process, the ATO will now be deciding on um, the eligibility for those requirements. So it'll bring these four DGR categories um, kind of into line with all of the other DGR categories that we administer. So information will be available on the ACNC register and your eligibility will be decided by the ATO. So things are all in place now and um, we're going through some, some changes and, and what it's looking like is that those changes will be in place by 1 July next year, 2019. Right. So it's quite exciting. Yeah, and the particulars of how this is all going to work and, and everything like that, whilst it's still to be decided, it, we can assume that this represents a streamlining of um, those requirements that you just described before where there were other government agencies involved in another assessment and all of that. We'll streamline all of that and make it a little bit more smoother for organisations that are seeking endorsement under one of these four categories. Yeah, and hopefully a lot less time consuming as well. So they'll yep. just fall in line and have the same service standards that our other um, our other categories have. Yeah, so the ones, if you've heard some stories about it taking a long time to get on a particular one of these four registers and, and the amount of um, waiting or the amount of uh, information you had to provide for the assessment, if you've heard stories about that in the past, it, it may no longer... Um, be reflected as such once they're all on the ACNC charity register and, and as Mel described, the, the requirements are, are aligned. But of course, look out for information about how this will work in, in practice in, in the coming months on the ACNC website. Now onto these two that we did touch on before, health promotion charities and public benevolent institutions. These are two uh, types of charities that have their own DGR categories with the ATO. So what that means is that the ATO has set aside a DGR endorsement 
if an organization is um, registered as this particular type of charity. The ACNC, of course, um, does the assessing of the, the charitable side of things. And once it's decided that an organization is either a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution, it will then, again, pass the information over to the ATO, who can then endorse the DGR um, for these two charities. But it, it's important to note that the decision on whether or not an organisation is a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution, and, and therefore whether or not it meets that key element of the key criteria of the ATOs, is a decision made by the ACNC. Um, but Mel, once we do pass on some information to the ATO and we tell the people at the ATO that this particular organisation, yes, it is a health promotion charity, please endorse the tax concessions, there's still a little bit of looking over for um, the staff at the ATO, right? Just a, just a little bit. So yeah. these are probably the two easiest categories of DGR that, that we look at because we accept the decision of the ACNC. So we say, yes, you are a health promotion charity. And then the only other thing that we need to then check off is that you have what we call a DGR revocation clause in your governing documents. So that's a, a very specific clause that um, outlines what your organisation has to do with any surplus gifts after you are wind up or your, your DGR endorsement is revoked. Um, so we just check if you've got that, bang, you're done. It's a really quick endorsement for us. They're, they're good um, and make people happy that we've been able to do it in a day. <laughs> so right. if, if, you don't, if you don't have that required clause in your governing document, we'll, we'll contact you. We'll talk to you about what you need to do and the changes that you need to make. So you might need to go back and have a general meeting to um, amend your governing documents, um, but we'll put your case on hold and we'll talk you through that process about what you know what you need to do and how to do it. So um, the the both the ACNC and the ATO um, on our on both of our websites we've got sample clauses that um, you know if you are just setting up your organisation and you you thinking you might want to apply for DGR endorsement, um, we've got some samples there of, of what to include in your governing rules. If you get it right the first time, then you don't need to go back and do those amendments because we all know that can be an expensive process for organisations. Um, but it's, it's a requirement that um, the ATO will insist on. Yeah, and we'll include a link in the follow-up email to the page on both websites where you can see the sample revocation clause that needs to be in an organization's governing document if they are to be endorsed for um, the DGR. So whilst it's an easy... Um, just, oh, yep, go ahead, Mel. Oh, I was just going to say, while, while we're talking about health promotion charities and public benevolent institutions, um, that those two types of charitable subtypes are also um, able to access the, um, the, the very the much sought after FBT exemption for their employees. Ah, so, yes, we did mention that earlier. Um, these, yeah, we, did, we did talk about it in detail. So these two particular types, of, these charitable subtypes, um, are the only two that are able to be um, endorsed by us for FBT exemption. And that, that basically means that public benevolent institutions and health promotion charities can provide exempt fringe benefits to their employees up to a capped amount of $30,000 per employee per year. So it makes it um, uh, worthwhile if you're eligible um, to do that because, you know, not all charities or not-for-profits have a lot of money to spend on staffing and things like that. So it's a way of um, enticing some good staff in if you can offer them um, that, that benefit. Yeah, right. So the, the uh, I guess uh, for for ease of people's understanding, it, you can think about charity tax concessions having the FBT rebate unless you're one of these two categories, a health promotion charity or a public benevolent institution, and in which case you would have that rebate um, topped up to an exemption. Yep, that's right. Yeah. Plus rebate the added is, bonus. Just, of, it's a discount. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. <laughs> I was, 
<laughs> I was going to say rebate is a discount and your exemption is just an, an exempt benefit up to that capped amount. And they have DJR endorsement too. So they are quite sought after uh, charity categories. And I was just going to mention before that whilst it may be an easy endorsement administratively for the ATO, um, deciding or meeting the, the requirements to be registered as one of these two charities um, is a little bit more involved on the ACNC side. So um, it, if you are thinking about registering an organisation as a charity under one of these two charity types, I urge you to really think about it and have a, a, a careful read through the information of both of the types or whichever type you're actually applying for on our website to get a clear understanding of um, the requirements and, and the criteria because it's worth understanding that and getting it right the first time which will then make the application process that much easier and um, be better for everyone I think. Um, just quickly um the if, if you are on the on our website at the moment you did want to have a look at these two uh, fact sheets for these two charity types it's acnc.gov.au forward slash hpc for health promotion charities and it gives you a fact sheet on what it what it what you need to do to be a health promotion charity and then for pbi it's acnc.gov.au forward slash pbi and that will take you to a fact sheet about um, being a public benevolent institution. So really read those carefully and have a look at the requirements because uh, we see many cases where people think that they slip easily into one of those two categories, but once you get into the details of the organisation's activities, it turns out it's not quite an easy fit. Okay. That brings us to the end of the formal presentation. Um, I've just got some resources here um, that will be useful to the audience, particularly on tax concessions on the ACNC website. So we've got some information on tax concessions, DGR, oh, what I just mentioned there about HPC and PBI, and um, the charity register itself, the place where you want to see if a charity is registered. I'll include these links in the follow-up email as well. So if you not keen on writing them down, don't worry, you'll get them in an email. And Mel, how about some useful ATO resources that people should know about? Um, so on our um, ATO website, ato.gov.au, we've got um, a brilliant not-for-profit tab. So if you hit the ATO homepage and just click on the not-for-profit tab, it'll open up um, a bit of a menu that um, can get you started. So a whole heap of information there. Um, we have also just put together uh, what we call ATO TV, um, which is really good. So um, you can do a search on that from the um, ATO homepage as well, just type in ATO TV. And there's a, a not-for-profit page on there. So when you click on that, there's a whole heap of webinars now that we've been doing, um, you know, over the past 18 months, two years, um, with lots of different topics. So we've actually got a DGR webinar, which goes over DGR endorsement in detail which is excellent um, we just did one this morning about gifts and fundraising so that will be available on ATO TV soon there's a there's a whole heap of ones about FBT um, yeah really practical good um, good resource there um, and then really importantly we have a not-for-profit information line um, it's at 1300 130 248 so we're open 8 to six Monday to Friday and our staff on that line um, that's all they do we just talk to not-for-profits and charities we also do all of your endorsements so our guys are just trained in not-for-profit things um, if you've got any kind of question you can give us a call whenever you feel like it we're very friendly <laughs> yep. um, and then, then there's some other links there that, that are really helpful there's a handover checklist for not-for-profit administrators um, some self-governance checklists and then we also have a not-for-profit news service that you can subscribe to that's a free um, a free news service newsletter that comes out okay but I urge to everyone read. to call us <laughs> Well, yeah, of course. And I think uh, there may be a lot of people that didn't know that there was a dedicated not-for-profit info line and the, um, and instead they just went through the, the main front door of the ATO's um, call yeah. centre. 
It's really good, that 1300 number. There's really no menu on that, guys. So you don't need to be pressing one for this and two for that. You just come through to an operator that um, looks after not for profits. Excellent. We have some questions come through. I had a heap of questions come through, so we'll try our best to get to a few of them in the time that we've got left. Um, and it looks as though they're mostly going to be aimed at you, Mill, with your tax expertise rather than the charity side of things. Um, can you give us an overview? Someone's asking about the reporting obligations to the ATO for charity organisations. Um, can you give us an overview of what uh, typically what a registered charity would need to report to the ATO if they're registered as, with the ACNC? Okay, so if, if a charity is registered with the ACNC, um, really they just are reporting to you on your annual activities um, statement every statement. year. Are you in, sorry, information statement. <laughs> yeah. um, so that that is just uh, kind of a one-stop reporting shop. Um, and the, the only difference to those are registered charities that fall into this very particular category, private and public ancillary funds. So they've got an additional obligation to the ATO to lodge an informational return as well. Um, but we set up streamlined uh, reporting for that. So that's, that's all done through the ACNC now as well. Um, the only other thing is that if uh, a charity or a not-for-profit is employing staff or they have a GST obligation, they're obviously going to have to um, submit a business activity statement like every other business. So right. um, that's basically it. But there's no income tax return if you've been endorsed by us as income tax exempt. Okay, yeah. The GST point, it's actually a good point because I think a lot of people would think that if they're registered with the ACNC, that absolutely everything is switched off with the ATO and the GST is an example of that not quite being the case. Yeah. And, and also if you have employees, you're going to have um, pay-to-go um, withholding requirements and, and, and superannuation. So in that respect, charities still have business type obligations with the ATO. Okay. There's another. There's a question here um, just touching on the information you mentioned about fringe benefits tax. Um, someone's asked about the ability for a charity or not-for-profit to attract good staff through personal tax concessions. Um, is is that an option? Is, say, being an employee at a registered charity um, entitled to the entitled the individual, the employee themselves, to any tax concessions? No, there's no. Um, I don't know. No, no discount on on personal income right. tax. <laughs> so everyone, um, the the same rules apply to everyone um, in Australia in that respect. Um, I wish I got staff discount but I don't <laughs> yeah, right. um, so but, but what you do have as a as a registered charity you have the you, you, you may have access to FBT rebate or if you fall into that health promotion charity or PBI um, subtype you may be able to have FBT exemption which means that you can um, reduce an, an employee can then perhaps sacrifice part of their cash salary um, so salary and wages to receive other types of benefits, non-cash benefits, and um, you as an organisation, you would normally have to pay fringe benefits tax on those, but you have um, some concession available to you. So in effect, your employee is reducing their taxable income um, and receiving um, benefits instead. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty complex system, the way that it works. The employee ends up paying less tax on their on on their take-home pay, um, but it's not a discount on their income tax. Yeah, right. It's, and it's that's done through sort the of, fringe benefits tax system. It, it's not quite the same, but it's sort of the trade-off, right? So that even though you can't offer yeah. the individuals the tax concessions, the, the fringe benefits tax uh, exemption and rebate gives a little bit of leeway for an organisation to at least uh, offer something, uh, something more to their employee. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the end result is the employee has a little bit more in their pocket than what they would normally have. So it's, it's um, um, yeah, people want that. Yep. Um, all right, just having a look at some of the other questions that are floating through. Um, 
And just once more, if we don't get to your question, never fear, we will endeavor to get back to you via email later on. Um, there's a question here, actually, just on the FBT um, topic again, about entertainment expenses and FBT. So um, a person in a charity has asked whether or not um, an individual's entertainment expenses um, can, I, I think they're asking if it can be claimed um, as part of FBT. Um, y yes, they can if um, obviously the charity has um, access to the right FBT concession. Um, there are some particular caps that are um, applied to entertainment for benefits, they're in a, a special little category. Those rules are quite complex and they vary, you know, depending on the organisation and what's being offered. Um, so I might kind of leave it at that and I would direct people to have a look at our website to have a look at that information. Maybe look at one of the webinars that's already um, up there um, and or also give, give the ATO a call um, to talk about fringe benefits tax and how that applies to your organisation. How about DGR categories? So we mentioned there are, uh, you said 50, right? Um, even though some of them are very, yeah. very specific and even obscure. Um, of those DGR categories, um, while they all have specific requirements tailored to the particular type of organisation that it's aimed at, do all the DGR categories require registration as a charity? Um. At the moment, no, okay. they don't. And this is a, a good, um, I think, topical question at the moment. So, but no, they don't. There are some categories that do have a requirement that you are a registered charity um, and that's a prerequisite. Um, there, with, with this DDR reforms, and we talked about the, the registers and the changeover with that, part of that reform is that um, all... DGRs will be required to be registered as charities. So the legislation will be changing um, in, the, okay. in the coming 12 months, um, which will, you know, mean some significant changes for organisations that are currently DGR endorsed um, and also ones that want to apply for endorsement in the future. So while that's not a requirement for every category at this present time, um, it will certainly become a requirement in the future. So another um, one where we have there, to watch some, the yeah, info coming out yeah, from both the ACNC and the ATO. Yeah, so there, there will be some carve-outs and things. Obviously, like government entities can't be registered charities. Um, and, and there, you know, may be some room in the legislation for um, the Commissioner of Taxation to provide um, some discretion or, or exemption to that requirement. But those, that hasn't been worked out yet. Right. Um, we've got a more practical question uh, for people involved in charities. I'm sure this would be um, relevant. Is the just managing receipts with deductible gifts? Um, d does an organisation have to give a receipt to every single donor for every single amount? Or d does the receipt have to contain certain information? W what are the rules for receipts and deductible gift recipients? Okay, this is a, it's a good question because I think people get um, confused with the requirements. So um, what we say is that there is no legislative requirement for a DGR to issue a receipt to a donor for a gift. So if the DGR doesn't have to like have a practice of issuing receipts, um, and, and it always falls back to the donor to substantiate their income tax deduction on their income tax return. So the tax office is always going to come back to the donor and say, um, show me how you're entitled to that, that deduction. Um, so the, the DGR is kind of... Well, well, not gets away with it, but they, they, <laughs> they're, not, they're not obligated to provide that receipt. But what we all know is that um, DGRs will generally provide the receipts to the donor because it's good practice and, um, you know, that you're, you're getting a gift, so you, you want to make it easier for your donor. Um, so we have some rules that if you do issue a receipt, you have to put particular things on them. So the things that you need to put on there are obviously the ABN um, of the organisation, the name of the organisation. If it's being donated to a fund that your organisation is operating, that name will need to be on there. 
obviously the amount and that the receipt is for a gift. Um, so that's the basic information that needs to be on there. If it's a receipt for a deductible contribution, say, you know, seat at a table at a fundraising dinner, then you'd need to specify that, you know, that is a, a, for an amount of a contribution and only for that deductible component of it. So that gets a little bit more complex. Yeah, right. Now we have, yeah, we have some information on our website about receipts um, and the information that you need to include on them. So if you're unsure, have a look at that or you can give us a ring and, and talk to us. The, most, the, the webinar that we did this morning, which would be worth having a look at, does talk about gifts and fundraising um, and, you know, these um, fundraising events and things like that can be really confusing. And it is worth getting your head around it because, well, one, as Mel said, good practice, but two, many donors will want a receipt too. So you don't want to sort of be left high and dry when a donor asks for a receipt and you don't really know what to do or how to how to produce it. As long as you know what you're supposed to do and know how, how to do it when there is the explicit request to re get a receipt for um, from a donor, then then you're able able to do it. I think we might finish with one more question. Um, sorry to... Uh, the, the people whose question we haven't been able to cover here in this Q and A session, but um, we hope the answers via text will suffice, and if and we can send you a, uh, an email later on um, with more detail. Um, so the the question that um, we've got is about um, self governance um, with the ATO. So if the if the requirements are if the if the reporting requirements. Um, for charities sit with the ACNC and that being filling out an annual information statement and um, organisations that aren't registered for GST obviously won't have to um, complete uh, statements for the ATO. Does the ATO require any other uh, sort of self-assessment or self-governance on the part of the, the charity that it may uh, ask to see at one point in the future or is it is it something that the ATO now leaves to the ACNC? Um, I, another good question. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we, it, the, the ACNC does a really good job um, and, and, and I think assist the ATO. So what, what we know is that all um, organisations that are registered charities with the ACNC and that have DGO endorsement with us are doing an annual return, um, an information statement, and they're providing information to the ACNC on an annual basis. Now the ATO can, you know, we can use that and we can look at what, what organisations are using their money for and how, how they're going about things. Um, we recommend, and what our legislation says, is that if you have a change in your circumstances, then you should review your um, eligibility um, and whether or not you're, you're still entitled to be endorsed as a DGR or for tax concession charity. Um, and you should let us know if, if you at some point find that you're no longer eligible, you should let us know as soon as possible um, after that happens. Um, the ATO also does reviews of particular um, categories of DGRs that we might see as uh, like high risk. So if we have some sort of idea that the money is not being used for um, the purpose for which you've been endorsed, um, we might um, run uh, a campaign of reviews over particular types of DGR endorsements and we will ask people for information about um, their organisations, their money, their fundraising that they collect and how they use their money and whether they're entitled to that endorsement. So. That's something that, that, that we do regularly um, in areas that we, where we have particular concerns. So it's not just set and forget. Um, it's your responsibility if you are DGO endorsed or endorsed for tax concessions to review those. You know, maybe you should do it on an annual basis when you have your annual general meeting. Look at the requirements. Are you still eligible? Um, and then let us know if your situation changes. Yep, and that would be part of just regular, responsible, good governance is to is to follow these sorts of um, processes and procedures regularly. Um, and it, if you are doing these sorts of things, if you are managing your charity in that responsible way, then this sort of review should be. Um, part and parcel of of um, what you're doing annually, or, or however 
often it might be. And, and it is worth reiterating that government departments um, do talk to each other. So if there is something that pops up on the ACNC's radar that may be relevant to the ATO as far as um, use or misuse of tax concessions and that sort of thing, then it, of course the, the ACNC and the ATO can, can um, discuss um, some things. Yeah, and it comes up quite often. So we, we will often get, um, you know, people refer through our tax evasion referral um, service, um, organisations that they have some concerns about. And then when we have a look into those, if anything pops up and it, it might impact on their ability to be registered as a charity, um, it's part of our responsibility to share that information with the ACNC. So we, we, we work really closely together in that way. All right. Thank you very much for that, Mel. Is there anything else that, that you would like to say? That became doom and gloom. <laughs> now we're ending on doom and gloom, but um, I hope it's sunny wherever you are in the country and you can go enjoy uh, a nice afternoon and some lunch in, in the sun um, to, to just brighten the day after all that compliance and nasty talk. Thanks very much for your time today, Mel. We really appreciate it. We always enjoy getting you guys at the ATO in to have a chat with us on a webinar about all things tax and I think as the attendance numbers show that it's one of our most popular um, topics and I think um, the audience today was very appreciative of all your knowledge and expertise. Thanks so much, thanks for having me. Is there anything else that you want to mention that you think the audience should know before we say goodbye? No, I think that's that's everything. I just, again, just invite everyone to give us a call at the ATO if you've got any tax-related questions. Yes, and that's it from us. So stay in touch with the ACNC as well. We've got the regular commissioners column and email updates that go out uh, fortnightly. Lots of web guidance, podcasts, video content and webinars such as this available on the website. And um, I just realised that we've got the number for our call centre and the time slightly wrong. It should say 5 p.m. there, not 6 p.m. So don't try and call us at 5.30 um, because it's the call centre is available from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Australian Eastern Time. But within that time frame, please give us a call, 13ACNC. That's 132262, and our friendly, helpful, knowledgeable staff will be able to take you through whatever um, information you need about your organisation or get us on email advice at acnc.gov.au. And, of course, we're pretty um, active on social media too. Thanks, everyone, for your attendance. Uh, thanks to Chris and Heath for answering all the questions on uh, Viotex. I, I'm sure they were... Um, able to deal with uh, your queries as we went through. And once again, Mel, thanks for your help today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks. Okay. We'll see you for the next webinar.